For the past seven years, I've had an impossible dream, you know, to try and get justice for my daughter's death. There is nothing worse than knowing exactly what's gone on and not having people believe you. You can often be branded as another. Well, she wasn't prepared to cop that. It's been seven agonising years since Kira Lee McLaughlin's life was cut short. And for seven years, her mother, Alison, has been begging the authorities to listen to her. It's crazy how it seems so difficult to find justice from a suspicious death that came from a violent relationship. It shouldn't be that hard. Ambulance, what's the town or suburb of the emergency? Woolboy, Queensland. Whether I think Paul killed Ms McLaughlin, he's certainly done nothing to help. Is she awake? No. Is she breathing? Yes. Alison was prepared to stand up and say, I know why my daughter died and I want answers. Now the world is listening to me and Kira won't be forgotten. She's not going to rest. That's the bloody good thing about it. It was very vindicating to have the coroner put it in writing that what I'd said all along was true. And it puts us closer on the path to justice. But we're nowhere near it yet. I was working in Gympie as a police officer and one afternoon in early 2014 we were called to Kira's house in Beena Valley Road. She had called triple zero and told us that her partner had gone off. So we went out there, uh, lights and sirens, code two. We pulled up at her driveway and she was standing outside. She just said, look, I'm sorry I shouldn't have called you. It was it's just a mistake. It's all fine now, it's all sorted. She was adamant she didn't want anything else done. So we basically had to drive away. A few months after I got the call out, I was sitting in the station doing paperwork. And you know, one of the other officers just said, did you hear Kira died? I just remember sitting going, what? Like, are you serious? And just felt the weight of it. This was a young mother of four children, 27, very healthy woman, who has presented to a hospital brain dead on arrival with multiple impacts to her body. I think my biggest question is, is why has nothing been done? Something's been not right about it from the beginning. You know, I mean, what was done to her was brutal. It was disgusting. This case has been haunting me because I, I feel for the victim, I feel for her family. So when, when I left the police, I thought, now I could do something about it because I'm not a police officer anymore. Jamie approached me and said, look, I, I want to start a podcast. Are you in? I was good mate to Jamie. I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> we had no idea how to podcast but we did have some experience in investigating through our police background. We thought maybe the best place to start this would be with the person who knew Kira the best. And that person's obviously her mum, Alison. I could tell that this is a woman who was obviously in a world of pain and hasn't received closure. She needed someone to tell her what had happened to her daughter. Hey, Alison. Then and only then could she good move on with you. her life. It's good to see you. Gotta hug ya. <laughs> you have milk? Kira was my only child. I wasn't really in the position to have another one. I was basically single the whole time, just the two of us. Excuse me, who's going away out of you two? Hey. Mum. Mum, where's Mum going? She New has York. an internet relationship. And this is your only daughter? This is my only child. Her pregnant only daughter. How would you describe her? What kind of sort of mum she be? Um, she's eccentric. Um, and she's loving. It's with another appropriate word. And she's consistent. 
I think is the best word. Consistently nuts. Consistently there. Kira was not submissive. She was a firecracker. She didn't take things lying down. She was happy, cheeky, sassy, very stubborn. <laughs> pretty independent little soul. You head through the yeah. hole. And she had a pretty, yeah. like, turbulent teenage well, years. She was going okay, but then her friend died, and Kira just lost yeah. it. So she actually struggled with mental health. She yeah. did, yeah, yeah, she did. When she met her husband-to-be, it all, yeah, it turned around. Yeah. It was like, right, I've got everything that I've always yeah. wanted in life. That was her wedding day. She was 18. And she was happy when she got married? Yeah, she was yeah. delirious. Yeah. Oh, oh look. She did get pregnant really quickly and it was just the happiest that I had ever seen her. She became serene, and serene is not a word I would use to describe Kira. Never, not in any way, shape or form. Have a look at it. We're all clean now. Look at the smiles. Okay, we'll go have some dinner. Right? So I'll punch you off the back of that line, if you just want to keep continuing. We need you to understand how this narrative has developed because it's complicated and it's dark. It is a rabbit hole that we've gone down to make sure Kira's death is not forgotten. I think the stress of four children wasn't easy on the marriage. She went looking elsewhere, not the right thing to do, but unfortunately she went looking in the wrong places. Kira called me in May of 2014 and she told me that she'd met someone and he was a dad at the school. Paul and Kira met at a local turkey and chicken farm. Paul had a long history of domestic violence and was well known to police for domestic violence offending and other matters. The first time I met him, which was at Kira's house, we sat and had a conversation down in the yard and some of the things that it told me, I just thought, no, this is not good. But then she was happy. And her happiness was everything, you know, because when she wasn't happy, it wasn't good. So I let it go and I didn't know what was going on. If I'd known, I would have been up there with an army. My brother is charming. He tells them they're beautiful, he's spontaneous. He's all those things that you really, really like when you first meet a dude. It's like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, and it's weird because he can just do the worst things to people and then throw puppy dog eyes and they literally forgive him and somehow feel sorry for him. It's incredible. According to the interviews I conducted from the neighbours, Kira and Paul were fighting every day or every other day. There was always an argument or a commotion going on there. He got his hooks into us so, so quickly. It just went from bad to bad fast. Kira would come over as usual, you know, a couple of drinks of a night or of a weekend or something, and he'd start messaging her. He'd step on his front um, veranda and yell at her. And we just yelled back at him. And after about three weeks, she'd just get up and go home. She just turned into like an empty shell, more or less. It was. No, it was pretty painful to yeah. see how much of a difference he made to her. Yeah. She couldn't get out of it. He had control of her money, her house, her children, everything. Kira actually told me that he had been in jail a couple of times um, during their relationship and that one of the reasons that he'd been in jail was because he'd actually hit her, he'd beaten her up. It, it's still hard for me to talk about because I'm so gobsmacked by it. This isn't the kind of thing that Kira would ever have stood for. I just wanted to get a better understanding of who Paul was and what he was like. So we're on the way to meet Katie. She was with him for about 13 years. 
What was he like with you? Was he restricted? Vicious. Yeah. Probably the only way you can explain it is vicious. Katie agreed to show me where the worst of the abuse happened. This is the shed. This is where you lived. Yeah. On the outside, he's all lovey-dovey and being nice and kind, and then back in here, it's getting threatened, you're gonna get killed, getting choked out, getting smashed around the place, having to protect the children, walking on eggshells. This is where he had me trapped. He's lunged at me, grabbed me by the throat. He's smashing my head into the ground while punching me in the face. And I'm losing consciousness and I've just grabbed all over the floor and what the first thing I found was a piece of ceramic toothbrush holder and I stabbed him in the side of the neck. That, that's where that happened. Very happy to leave it behind because how far I've come and what my kids have now. is a far better life than this. Hearing what Katie went through gave me a better understanding into what Kira might have experienced. Kira and Paul, they were together for about nine months. We had grave fears for the safety of the children because of the situation Kira was living in. Kira's husband Roger was able to get legal support to take the children and I moved up from New South Wales to assist him with taking care of them. Kira was very hurt, was very angry and the conversation I'd had with Kira was this is no longer just about her safety, this is about her children's safety and I said what will it take for you to understand how serious this is. She responded with you're blowing this out of proportion you and hung up the phone. It's really hard to take someone's kids away from them. But we had to do what was best for the children and I was going to go back for her. Sometime early evening on Wednesday the 16th of July 2014, Kira called Roger to say goodnight to the kids. I could hear her and she just sounded just sad, broken-hearted. The next afternoon, about 18 hours later, I got a call to say the ambulance had taken Kira away. The ambulance arrived at Kira's house on Bina Valley Road at about 2.25 p.m and she was flown to the Gold Coast University Hospital and Alison arrived and had to say goodbye. And the doctor just looked at me and she said, there's nothing, there's zero brain activity. Considering the marks on her face, it seems to me that she was bashed into the ground continuously. They told us when we were nursing that the hearing is the last thing to go. You talk to a person who's unconscious as if they can hear you. And that's what I did. I had all that time with her. And I promised her that I would make sure her children were taken care of and that I would get the bastard who did this to her. Given what we found out about Paul McDonald's history, there's no doubt Kira McLaughlin's death was suspicious. But the problem was proving it, because events that night were so complicated and circumstantial. Paul told emergency services that there was a family gathering at Kira's house that night, and there was a fight between Kira and another woman. Paul told authorities that during that fight, Kira may have hit her head in a wardrobe. There was a big dispute last night with my sister and her. They had a big fight. My sister beat into her. And then Paul told emergency services she took an overdose of antidepressants. My partner is a suspected overdose on the leg run. Do you think it was accidental or intentional? Intentional. OK. But reading the autopsy, there was no evidence of that overdose. There was only therapeutic levels of that antidepressant, so it's a massive discrepancy. 
I was reading the list of injuries. I got to 27 and it kept going and it kept going. Got to 105. I was waiting for the police investigation to start to see if he would be arrested. And it seems he was and was then released. The detectives sat in my lounge room and said to me, we know he has a terrible, horrible, very bad history with women, but he didn't do this. And at that point, I thought, what is the point in talking to these guys? Alison wanted answers for Kira. Peter Boyce is a Sunshine Coast lawyer. He's fairly well known. He was involved in the Daniel Morgan case. And so she reached out to him. Peter. Here's a mum trying to find out what happened to my daughter in her last moments. How you been? Yeah, okay. She'd be entitled to say, I'm very suspicious about what happened. Can I give you a hug? There's a lot to be levelled at the police about what sort of priority was this getting. We're dependent on them as a society to make sure that they act responsibly, quickly and reasonably. But I would say, if you ask me, um, I'd find it difficult to say they've met any of those tests, and that's pretty poor. I must say, I think um, the podcast has been helpful. So it's just hard to get your head around what actually happened that night and why has there not been, you know, a result or a charge or a criminal proceeding? you got to take a step back and remember that the police need to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And to get that level of evidence, it's not always easy. The events of the 16th and 17th of July 2014, it's confusing, it's conflicting and trying to just navigate your way through those two days, it's hard, it's a feat in itself. Paul's sister, Tamika, was one of the people at the family gathering that night. And they're having a good time, having a dance, everything's good. But Tamika says at some stage, Kira and her just start to have a fight. Well, I'm pretty sure I said something disgusting to Paul, like put your dog on a leash or something like that. Pretty much saying like that she was burning up, you know, and starting to call shit and to go stop it. Kira had flicked the switch. She was hysterical, she was mad, she was like in a rage. She glassed Tamika. There's a red can of paint somewhere in there that got thrown around and Tamika admits to punching um, Kira four times. I know that she fell backwards each time. She sprung up really fast. Where did you hear her? Um, on the side of the head, pretty, pretty much there, I'd say. Apparently Kira was standing up, she was alert, she was awake. It was just before 8.30 p.m. and Kira had had enough. She told everybody just to get off her property, just go, just leave. It's unclear what happened after this, but the accounts I got from neighbours suggested there was a violent incident that happened later that night, after Tamika and the family had left, and when Kira and Paul were home alone. I could hear a lot of kin smashing, Kira was screaming, ferociously, like it was a blood curdling scream. And then it all went silent. It was completely silent for about two to three minutes. Okay. And then I could hear Paul down towards the bottom of the shed. And from everything I could tell, I believe he was making a phone call. Right. And um, like I can remember the words he said clear as day still. It was, I fucked up. I don't know what to do. I need help. Right. Like, yeah, I've done something bad. I need help right now. Paul told many people many different stories about Kira that night. He told his family that Kira was fine, they went to bed, they had sex, and he woke up at 1.30 p.m. the next day. He found Kira was unresponsive, so he picks her up, puts her in the shower, tries to wake her up, still nothing. What we know next is that Paul called his brother Nakoda that afternoon. I got a phone call asking me what he should do. Should he call the ambulance? Kira is not right. I said, you're an idiot. What are you doing calling me? You should be calling an ambulance. That's your partner. Paul didn't call an ambulance until 2.15pm that afternoon. Kira, 
you know how long she's been asleep for? Since three that I know of. Three this morning? Yes, yes. So all day. Does she look a normal skin colour? My face is very bruised from what my sister's done to her. So are you sure it's bruised? Yes, ma'am, and she's got black eyes and stuff. She's my life. Paul would just say that I did it and I destroyed his life and I took the one person that he loved away from him. I think he just knew that there's not much that I'll back down from, but every time he said it, it, it just crushed me. I met Tamika at a pub on the Sunshine Coast with Alison. Tamika was very nervous about it. I was surprised she actually showed up. I put a mic on her and Alison just gets involved and starts asking questions. When you left at 8.30, can you remember seeing bruising on her face? No. This girl had been led to believe that she killed my daughter. Four punches from a girl who weighs probably 55 kilos ringing wet? I don't think so. She was so fragile to me, it was very obvious. Alison was really understanding. I remember thinking at the time, I'm literally trying to tell this lady that there's a possibility that I did this and she's still saying it's okay. But I could have done it. I'm you didn't to you do I'm it. Just, you I'm didn't. I'm so sorry if I did. Whatever part you played, I forgive you. At that point, we started to get to a bit more of the media part of the narrative. Tamika was contacted by a woman who goes by the name of Sally. She was too terrified for us to use her real name. Sally went out with Paul after Kira died. While they were together, Paul confessed to Sally that he had killed Kira. She wanted me to know that I didn't do it and that she was going to tell the police in the homicide that he'd done it, that he was smashing her head into the tiles um, and he didn't mean to and she was unconscious and he freaked out and he didn't know what to do. Paul is in prison at the moment, um, where he's serving his time for offences in relation to Sally, such as assault and deprivation of liberty. He went to jail in August 2018. You can't be out in the world if you're just going to hurt people. That's not human. For more than five years after Kira McLaughlin died in her home outside Gympie, a coronial inquest will attempt to cut through the mystery surrounding her death. Peter Boyce and Alison have been pushing for a coronial inquest since day one. Finally, the inquest hearing started in September 2020 in Gympie. No one has ever faced charges over her death. Her mother says she hopes the inquest finally brings some answers. It's a start. Even though it's been a long time waiting for a start, it's a start. The inquest couldn't have been more damning for Paul McDonald. 26 witnesses gave evidence. One of the striking things in the inquest was that Tamika was shown a photograph, particularly of the lounge area, and Tamika made it a very clear house wasn't like that when she left. Some of the crime scene photos showed that there was a hole in the toilet wall, there was a broken broomstick on the couch, and a baseball bat that was outside when Tamika left was found inside. Photos show the house was completely trashed after Tamika left. It's a mess. What was driving that, I don't know. But it's clear that there's some evidence within that house. The coroner commissioned expert medical evidence and it was really powerful. We heard from top neurosurgeon Terry Coyne who told the court that it was more likely the catastrophic head injury which caused Kira's brain to swell and ultimately killed her it happened later in the night rather than the fight with Tamika earlier that night. We heard another bit of crucial evidence from Dr Adam Griffin, who is the director of the clinical forensic medical unit. The coroner asked me to review the cause of death. There's three main areas of bruising on the head uh, that were concerning. There was a bruise in the middle of her forehead that appeared to be from a rounded object, which could be a baseball bat. 
There's a very large bruise on the back of her head, which was described uh, as feeling boggy by the um, doctors who treated her. The third pattern of bruising was a significant one for me, was the presence of petechiae, which are pinpoint bruises, little tiny uh, hemorrhages that can occur with strangulation. I can say that I think uh, the most likely cause of her death was strangulation. Paul's defence lawyers argued that there was too many hypotheses. It could have been a combination of alcohol plus antidepressants or a seizure or she could have stumbled or fall and that the choking was speculative. The inquest finished on the 13th of April 2021, which would have been Kira's 34th birthday. The wait for the results was excruciating. Your passcode has been confirmed. Hey, Hello, it's Peter Boyce here. As we were sitting there listening to the coroner hand her findings down, uh, I was just in shock. You know, she didn't mince her words. I was stoked that she accepted the neighbour's evidence, Tamika and Sally's evidence, and I could feel Alison's emotions. It is really good. Thank you. It was amazing. It, it was amazing. And it was very, very clear. The coroner stated that Paul's criminal history showed him to be a serial perpetrator of severe domestic abuse, with over 70 convictions for domestic violence-related offending, including towards Kira. And she ultimately found that Paul caused Kira's death. I, I don't think I've ever seen the finding as strong. I find that Miss McLaughlin's death was caused by Mr. McDonald either choking her or alternatively inflicting head injuries. That can't be any stronger. You know I have to hug you. Uh, You've saved my life. Hello, it's my privilege. It's like we've done it. I could feel Kira with me. You know, and and when the when the coroner finished, I heard her. I heard her say to me, "I'm so proud of you, Mum." I did. Okay, All right, so Alison. we'll be talking to you soon. The coroner has found a gimpy woman whose death has remained unsolved for more than six years died at the hands of her de facto partner. But despite a long-running police investigation, no one has ever been charged. The coroner didn't make any adverse findings on the police investigation as it wasn't in the scope of the inquest, but she did say that the police acted appropriately in all areas. Hello, Peter Boyce. I think there's been a number of failures in the police investigation. The fact that the coroner went to the expense of getting expert medical evidence is another reason why you would be very concerned about the quality of the investigation. That should be the role of a competent investigator. Now, having got those findings, we're off to the police commissioner say you are to society, not just to Alison, to do this review of this investigation properly. We always have a look at what we've done to see if we could have done better. And I'm very, very comfortable with the police investigation, as was the coroner. It'd be great to have a utopian view where we can just make evidence be what it needs to be. Um, but. We struggle, uh, sometimes we do really struggle. Based on the coroner exercising those additional powers that we don't have, uh, we're now in a position where we can, we can further pursue with some of these um, allegations. And those investigations are continuing in partnership with our homicide squad. We have not given up on this and we are continuing our investigation and it, it will continue until we get the answers that we need. I'm still not convinced that this case was given the priority it needed by the criminal justice system. Justice delayed is justice denied. And in the seven years since Kira died, Paul has gone on to abuse more women. I still haven't given up hope that police and prosecutors will get all the evidence they need and there will be justice for Kira, Alison and Kira's children. Mummy, gotta let you play with me. Go away, so you can eat his bottle She loved the idea of growing up with her children and watching them have a life. Yeah. I think that's the saddest part of all of this, that her children have to grow up without her. 
I don't have to say a bit of a messy boy. <laughs> no fine dining for you for a little while. I still miss her. Miss her all the time. Especially when the kids do something special. I just get so very proud of those children, I could explode. You know, so they're doing really well with their lives. Dinner. By his lovely mother. Since the inquest, I'm a different person. It's given me back my life. Well, not all of it. And it will never be the same. But the, the new life, which is life without Kira. Just the outlook is better and it's redemption. <laughs>